the British people. They are trying to do it in a more sensitive way, in a way that doesn't simply reinforce the educational advantage of the middle classes. We know that at least part of their plan will be to, see, to allow existing grammar schools to expand, but the really resonant issue will be whether they allow these new free schools to select on the basis of ability. If that happens, and all the signs are that that will happen, then you can expect this to be the first major political row between the Tories and Labour of Theresa May's premiership. Robert, thank you. Meanwhile, the thorniest issue on Mrs May's foreign affairs agenda, Brexit, has also been to the fore. As you saw in Neil Connery's report, she's been holding talks with the European Council President Donald Tusk. Well, once inside Downing Street, Mr Tusk told the Prime Minister he wanted the Brexit process to begin as soon as possible, but he accepted the ball was now in her court. The 2016 Paralympic Games opened in spectacular style in Rio last night with a carnival atmosphere. A daredevil stunt by a wheelchair athlete helped the Games off to an explosive start. Despite concerns over slow ticket sales, the 78,000 capacity Maracana Stadium looked pretty full to capacity. But party over today, attention turns to the competition proper, as Martha Fairley reports. In a spectacle of power, strength and courage, US Paralympian Aaron Fotheringham launched himself and the opening ceremony of the Games that prove anything is possible. Dancers created a carnival atmosphere as celebrations got underway at Rio's Maracanã Stadium. Great Britain! Led by flag bearer Lee Pearson, members of Paralympics GB joined the parade of 159 nations. Over 4,300 athletes will compete in the largest ever Paralympic Games. Cheering them on at British House, Paralympics GB's home from home for the next 11 days were their friends and families who've supported them on their journey to Rio. From the children carrying the Paralympic flag, wearing boots designed so they can play football with their parents, to the dance between Paralympian Amy Purdy and an industrial robot. This opening ceremony was filled with the promise of the superhuman performances to come. Through your performances, tell your story, a narrative of inclusion, a tale of empowerment, and a legend that hope will always conquer fear. Despite worries about slow ticket sales, this was a sellout crowd, and 78,000 applauded the efforts of torchbearer Marcia Malsar as she got up and carried on after a momentary slip. Injury, adversity, and even the Brazilian rain can't extinguish the Paralympic spirit. Martha Fairley, ITV News. Martha Fairley reporting there. Richard Pallow is in Rio this lunchtime. Richard, who should be watching out for today? Well, there'll be plenty of British athletes in action today. A couple of medal chances, but who we really should be looking out for is Dame Sarah Storey. Now, she's competing in the 3,000 metres individual pursuit in the velodrome. She, of course, won that title in London. Uh, if she wins tonight, and her final is tonight, uh, she will become the most successful female Paralympian British, that is, of all time, with her 12th gold medal, and that will surpass Dame Tanny Gray Thompson's record. So she's the one really to look out for. The honour of being the first British competitors, well, that went to two female shooters. Karen Butler, you can see on the left, Lorraine Lambert on the right in the R2 10-metre air rifle. There's also a lot of heats and qualifiers in basketball, football. Uh, Great Britain are playing Brazil, of all people, swimming and table tennis. But I think tonight the other person to look out for is Johnny Peacock. He lit up London, the athlete, in the T4400 metres. Amazing performance to win that. He starts his qualifiers in the stadium this evening. Richard, thank you. Here, millions of pounds is to be spent on new temporary flood defences in England as part of a government plan to avoid more devastating floods this winter. The National Flood Resilience Review was set up after storms last Christmas inflicted misery on thousands of people in the north of the country. Well, today, they identified more than 500 areas of the country that are still vulnerable. 
Our correspondent Damon Green is live now in Calder Valley in West Yorkshire, an area repeatedly hit by flooding in recent years. Um, Damon, how do you suppose that this money may help areas like where you are? Well, this area, particularly where I'm standing, Mytham Road in West Yorkshire, it won't be helped at all. This £12.5 million is for temporary uh, flood defences and is for seven specific areas, not this one. Some of the details we've uh, learned today, I think you can see them. It's £12.5 million on temporary defences, including barriers and high volume water pumps at seven locations around the country and increased protection of local infrastructure, including telephone networks, energy and water facilities, and also a stress test to understand the flooding, the risk of flooding from seas and rivers around England over the next 10 years. That £12.5 million is in addition to the £2.5 billion already set aside for flood defences and today ministers said that all of that money will make communities and homes safer. That long-term budget has really helped the Environment Agency to work uh, and have a comprehensive vision and all the work that was, was achieved in the flood review will also help beyond 2020 for us to start working on the plans in order to continue to protect hundreds of thousands of more homes than were protected before. Well, Mytham Road, where I'm standing, has its own uh, flood alleviation scheme worth millions of pounds. And no one in the town is saying there's any short of money to tackle the problems. What they're a little concerned about is whether they have enough time to tackle the problems, the risk of flooding in the near future. Now, behind me, the river walls, which are, all, are still damaged from the floods on Boxing Day last year, they're to be repaired, to be raised and strengthened. Also, the channel of the river has to be widened. But all of this work will take an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of cooperation between between the various landowners uh, whom it affects. Uh, they say as well, whatever the flood defences end up like, they would not prevent the same floods we saw on Boxing Day last year. Uh, and so if the same amount of rain flood uh, fell tonight, the same flood would happen all over again. Damon, thank you. An experiment which is trying to find out if the weather affects people with chronic pain like arthritis has produced some early results which suggest there is indeed possibly a link. Around 9,000 people across the country are recording their symptoms all year around via a smartphone app. The research has already found that the group suffered less pain when the weather warmed up between February to April, but pain again increased in June when the weather became even hotter, but it rained a little more. From Salford, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr Will Dixon from the Arthritis Research UK group, which is leading this study, Heat and rain. Is this in effect an old wives tale coming true? Well in nearly every clinic that I run in my hospital uh, patients will tell me that their joints are better or worse because of the weather and this is a belief that's been held for thousands of years um, but researchers have never worked out the relationship. So we're trying to answer this ancient belief using the power of technology that people carry with them. Um, in our study, Cloudy with a Chance of Pain, funded by Arthritis Research UK, um, we ask people who have chronic pain to download the study app to report their symptoms, and the smartphone automatically collects the weather data local to where they are. Now, arthritis, as I understand it, is often caused by granular deposits on, on, on the joints. I mean, could it really be as simple as either those granules expand in the heat or draw in moisture or whatever? Is, is it that direct a link likely? Uh, I, I struggle to hear the question because there's two feeds in my, my ear. Um, the, uh, there's lots of different types of arthritis, um, but it's definitely plausible that the climate might influence uh, symptoms, definitely. And are you hearing me OK now? I'm sorry about the noise interference. Uh, yeah, what uh, yes, I was I saying was the effect of climate, heat, moisture on the granules that cause arthritis sufferers such pain. Uh, well, it, it may affect the degenerative types of arthritis, like osteoarthritis, that one in five people have. Uh, it may affect the inflammation from rheumatoid arthritis. There's, there's lots of different types, so we need to work out what the relationship is, and then we can pass on to other scientists to work out how that relationship exists. Absolutely. Now, you're all very, very clever men and women, I know, doing this, but, but you can't do much about the climate other than that macro-global thing we're all trying to do. This presumably informs, however, drug treatments that are going to help folk who suffer from arthritis. Absolutely. So if we understand the relationship between 
um, what it is within the weather that influences pain, then indeed we might be able to understand the mechanisms of pain and lead to new treatments. Now we've managed to track people through to the summer, but we need far more people to uh, join the study taking part from the summer through to winter. So anyone with chronic pain can visit the website at cloudywithachanceofpain.com, um, uh, download the study app and take part. Will Dixon, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come, why a butterfly and a rogue sound system heaped misery on Andy Murray at the US Open. But first, a children's charity has reported an alarming increase in the number of calls that it receives from children seeking help for suicidal thoughts. A report by the NSPCC found that its phone support service, Childline, held almost 19,500 counselling sessions about suicide in the last year, and that is one every half an hour. Susan Verdi has been speaking to one man whose brother took his own life. All smiles and having fun. Aaron and his little brother Liam were inseparable. But when Liam reached his teen years, all that changed. He became withdrawn and quiet, and no one, not even his big brother, could reach him. In 2010, aged just 14, Liam took his own life. We tried our best, you know, Mum, Mum called the ambulance and I was um, doing CPR on him and, uh, you know, it was yeah, a, a part of me wanted to believe that there was a chance, but um, you know, my heart and heart knew that he had already done. Liam took his life six years ago. But grim figures out today from the NSPCC reveal the number of youngsters having similar thoughts is rising. Last year, their advice service, Childline, took nearly 19,500 calls about suicidal thoughts, with advisers giving 53 suicide counselling services a day. That's risen by 50% in the past five years. The NSPCC says the government must spend money to set up local mental health services to help desperate teenagers. A lot of children are actually saying to us, look, there's absolutely no hope in actually carrying on and that's why they're increasing their threats to self-harm and commit suicide. And it's really very, very worrying. For Aaron, nothing can bring his brother back, but he's raised £64,000 for Childline in the hope others can get the help they need and won't have to lose a loved one to suicide. If I had the opportunity to speak to Liam now, um, the first thing I'd probably say is I love him. Um, that's a hard thing not to be able to say. Aaron Hearn ending that report from Suzanne Vierdy. Two young men have been arrested on suspicion of terror offences. Officers from Scotland Yard detained a 19 and a 20 year old at an address in West London as part of a planned anti-terror operation. And MPs are warning the Palace of Westminster faces an impending crisis and a growing risk of a catastrophic event if essential renovation work is not carried out. So, a six-year plan costing £4 billion suggests moving the Commons Chamber to the Department of Health and the Lords to the QE2 Conference Centre while that work is done. You may have heard Andy Murray is out of the US Open after a shock defeat in the quarterfinals. He was expected to win, but a few unusual distractions and an artful opponent brought his golden summer run of victories to a halt. But after an unrelenting year on the court, could tiredness have also been a factor? Nick Wallace has more. It was all going so well, but after a phenomenal year, Andy Murray came unstuck. He had to cope with a determined opponent a rain delay, a butterfly on the court, and a misfiring public address system. It's three play points. Murray was in control of the rally and understandably furious. It proved a turning point, and Kai Nishikori went on to win the match. Afterwards, Murray played down his frustration. It was the fourth time it had happened in the match, and that was the first time that we stopped the point, and I was just curious why that, why that was, and that was it. 2016's meant a busy eight months for Andy Murray. He's competed in 13 tournaments, reached the Australian and French Open final and won Wimbledon, of course. He also won singles gold at the Rio Olympics last month and in total has played 76 matches, including doubles and exhibitions. Even before last night's defeat, Davis Cup captain Leon Smith said Murray's demanding schedule could be tiring him out. Yet he's expected to play in the next Davis Cup tie in Glasgow next week. 
The player himself wasn't offering any sort of excuse, but going out at the quarter-final stage of the US Open was the last thing he or anyone else was expecting. Nick Wallace, ITV News. And our sports correspondent Ian Payne is here. What do you reckon? Uh, I think fatigue possibly had something to do with it, Alistair, um, because he's played a lot of tennis, as you saw. That match lasted over four hours. But it's only the third time in the last eight years that he's lost a five-setter. The other two were to Novak Djokovic. I do think, though, that that interruption from the sort of News at Ten style bong <laughs> halfway through the, uh, the fourth set definitely affected him because he said it did afterwards and he lost seven games in a row after that. And that really was a crucial point. Sometimes his frustrated ranting can get the better of him. Maybe this was one of those occasions. When he's also flying the flag, the Olympics, the Davis Cup, he seems absolutely triumphant. This is just for bucks. Does that make any difference? I don't think it makes any difference. He's certainly proud to play for his country, yeah. but I don't think there's a sort of different... He, he differentiates between one or the two. He's had an amazing year, really has, as you see. He's won Wimbledon, he's won the Olympic title as well. He was just two matches away from being first person for years to get in all four Grand Slam finals. And the great thing about Andy Murray is he seems to be um, giving some of his success to some of the younger British players now. Because at the US Open, we had some really good success. I mean, Kyle Edmund was doing brilliantly. Dan Evans had some really good wins. Johanna Conter has had some good wins as well. So maybe, maybe, finally, we've actually got a little bit of inspiration for our youngsters. All right. Ian, thank you very much. Now, before we go, the latest Guinness Book of Records has been published this morning. Among the new entries is Lizzie, the Great Dane, who is named as the tallest living female dog. On our website, itv.com slash news, there are more of the unusual additions to the book. A magnificent creature. That is it this lunchtime. Mary Nightingale and Mark Austin will be here with the ITV Evening News. The news where you are follows the national weather. But for now, from all of us, bye-bye and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.